Hi, everyone. I'm Greg Kane, uh, Vice President of Baseball Data. Um, and um, so we're going to walk through the new StackHouse system that we uh, have been working on for the last oh, year and a half, if not longer than that. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, going back to 2014 or so, we launched the, 20, the, the StackHouse system then. Um, you know, we didn't know, um, we learned, we've learned a lot since we launched the system, but you know, back then we had the two vendor two vendor solution with Kyron Higo and Trackman, uh, both providing things, both from a radar perspective and from uh, a player uh, a camera player tracking perspective. You know, like I said, we learned a lot over the time as we went into the system. We didn't have a, a specific accuracy or SLA requirement baked into what, what the platform was, but over time, we, as we kind of uh, worked through the understanding of the system, there we were able to we, we realized that the, the the accuracy was about. You know, a plate, an inch and a half at plate location in 2017, which was you know you know consistent with what we had prior to that with you know with the the pitch play system prior to that pitch tracking going back to 2007, um, and then we we dial it in a little bit further in 2018 as we added the camera system as we wanted to get more accuracy out of the system, um, but we had some you know some a location accuracy of plus or minus 15 feet on on hits because of some other limitations that were there. Um, and so we had limited coverage of, of pop-ups, grounders, balls down the line, you know, throws across the field, the third to first kind of throw or pickoff attempts, which were limitations of the system that we knew going into it. We had a radar system that had a field of view that once the ball lost, lost left that field of view, um, we would lose the ball at that point and just kind of reject, which is where the hit location accuracy would come in. And then, you know, as being a radar system, it required velocity to or from the radar to uh, have the system um, track the ball. So those throws across the field and some of those other coverage areas were, were more difficult. We did a lot of work to make sure, make, make sure the system and the data that we provided looked as complete as we possibly could, but um, you know, still we had those limitations. And somebody told me long ago that one of the key elements of, of tracking systems and kind of using the data at scale was that we needed completeness and accuracy across all fronts in order to use all the data in certain ways. You know, we had some tricks that we put in place to, to compensate for some of that, but the limitations were still present. Um, so, you know, we had Kyron, so as far as the operation of the system, we had Kyron Higo software that uh, MLB operators were running, um, but it required Kyron Higo to set up and calibrate those systems. Um, and, you know, improvements and new features would have to go through Kyron Higo. So some of our uh, development pipeline, uh, you know, was based on this third party, you know, providing, you know, updates to their tracking, to their tool in order for us to make any manipulations to the data that we needed as well. Um, and then, as I said before, we added uh, the camera to the system in 2018 to enhance the radar system with optical tracking, which they really kind of snapped in the, the accuracy and kind of improved upon the, some of the inconsistencies that we found over using the system over the first few years. Go ahead and the next slide. Um, so for the next generation system, Clay and I and a handful of others, we, we sat down to start thinking about, well, what did we learn in the first system? As I mentioned, we wanted accuracy and completeness, but we want to make sure that you know, we're using the latest technology and make sure that we were preparing for the future um, coming out of this. So you know, as the more we learned about you know, machine vision and machine learning, um, we realized that, that a, a camera system probably was, was really was a good area to focus on, um, specifically with the advances and some of the things we've seen. Um, obviously, the, we we worked with Trader with Trackman in the past, and, and we were working with them as well. Um, but we needed the, them to add in the player tracking technology. So, um, so that so that was one area that we wanted to focus on. Another area was we wanted to make sure we worked with one vendor specifically. We ended up choosing Hawkeye in the end, but we wanted to specifically work with one vendor because the uh, the, the dual vendor relationship, you know, very good partners that we had in the two of them, but just it created some dynamics that we needed to, to a single vendor would, we wouldn't have. Um, and then I said before, you know, the the other area we needed to make sure that everything was accurate and we had full complete coverage of everything on the field. And then we wanted that other element to add in an SLA so that we could think of all the areas that where we really need accuracy, make sure we have an understanding uh, between the two the, the companies so that we could could make sure we could could enforce that. Um, and then, you know, again, we wanted to make sure that uh, we could control the system ourselves so that uh, rather we could build our own operation tools so that you know, we could plug in other vendors if we want to down the line, if we if we want to do various other things as well so that we can, can develop the system ourselves, you know, make any changes that we want to and really apply the baseball logic to this tracking data that we get out of it. You know, it'll be being the baseball, the owner of that baseball logic, making sure that we could do that so we could do this along our own timeline. And also we wanted to increase the automation as well. So other elements around this to 
you know, identify the players automatically through jersey number detection or through other means. Uh, we wanted to make sure that, that was another key tenant of the system as well. Um, and then again, it, it's, you know, we wanted to build a foundation for the future of, it, of tracking systems so that we could make it extensible, you know, adding in additional elements to it so that we could, you know, augment what we were seeing, you know, to keep the baseline of what we had from 2015 to 2019. We want to make sure that those data points were present, but make sure that we had the ability to add in other elements so that we could continue to extend that. Um, so you'll see some things around player track, uh, skeletal tracking, bat tracking, and some high frame, high frame rate stuff that we're, we're considering in the future as well. So through our selection process, like I said, we, were, we, we defined the requirements back in 2018. Um, we worked with a few vendors, did some testing in the off season between 20, 2018 and 19. And then ended up choosing Hawkeye as our vendor through some of the, the demos that they showed us and, and just kind of the, the um, from what we saw from the, the demo, we showed, it showed that we had some really interesting capabilities that we didn't have prior to that. Um, and then, you know, corollary to that, we also chose a new uh, cloud provider as well to, uh, for our, all our compute and cloud storage as well uh, in Google. Go, ahead, go to the next one. So, um, look like. So we're using state-of-the-art emergent vision, emergent vision cam, machine vision cameras, excuse me. Um, there's Sony sensors that are actually inside the device, but Emergent uh, is a company that really focuses on machine vision use cases. Um, there's their 4K cameras. Um, they actually have a little bit more resolution than this, you know, true 4K where, you know, we can kind of use the full access of the, of the sensor to get full screen or full view of it. They have a max rate, max camera rate, uh, um, frame rate of 120 frames per second and they output data 10 gigabits per second, which is a lot of data if you, if you don't know. Um, so we have 12 cameras in our system and the range around the field, as you see here, um, the red, kind of the orange or red dots that you see or cameras that you see there are the, the ones that are focused on the plate volume, pitch to plate volume. So that's the, the pitch to plate cameras. They are you know, 4K, they're running at 100 frames per second. The camera in center field is focused on specifically on spin. It's an addition that we, we asked Hawkeye to add specifically as, you know, obviously clubs and, and others are very interested in spin rate data. And we know something we had to make sure we had in the system. Um, and then there, the yellow uh, cameras you see there as well are, um, you know, cameras five through 11 are the additional cameras that allow for uh, player tracking. Now, all the cameras do all the tracking, but, you know, the, the, the red ones are focused specifically or more dialed into that, that play volume where the yellow ones are more zoomed out and can see everything. But if say there was a failure in one of the, the pitch to play cameras, we can use one of the yellow cameras to then track the ball from that perspective. They all contribute to the tracking as a whole and then, and then um, are able to out, output data from that perspective. So because this camera system is, is modular, we can add more cameras than just the 12. Um, you know, we could add, have as many as we like. So in the future, we can then also include some you know, high frame rate cameras, additional cameras, it requires a different type of network, so we haven't gone down that path yet, but it's something that uh, clubs are considering as augmenting the data that we're providing, but also that's something that we're considering in the future that we would add to the system potentially to, you know, specifically around pitcher and, and batter mechanics to kind of show that, to you know, show what that looks like specifically. Go on to the next one. Right, so how, how are we integrated with them? So Hawkeye is, you know, they're tracking, so we view Hawkeye as a tracking provider. So they're outputting just tracking elements. They're doing some identification. So they're doing some of the uh, jersey number detection and things of that nature uh, to provide to us. But really it's just where are objects in space and they're providing that to us. And that flows into our system and we have a live operator who's looking at the live data, who sees the live data and is able to make the adjustments as they see a fit based on, you know, making sure that the assignments of all the players on the field are correct. Uh, some of the other metadata around the game is correct. But make sure, making sure that things are running smoothly so that and, you know, some of the uh, you know, shift graphics that we show make sure that the, the data attribution is correct there, that the, you know, the right players are, are tagged as correctly um, so that they can um, use that on broadcast in real time. Uh, the Scrubber is, is, is the second system that we have in place, which you know, after the real time data comes through, once the play is completed, we have all of the data for that play. We're able to then process that data, you know, output all the metrics that we have, but also part of that process is a lot of errors that we can see to detect, you know, various conditions. You know, in a very simple example, do we have nine players on the field? Are all nine nine accounted for in all frames in the video? 
And those error messages that we're able to detect there automatically are pushed back to an operator uh, through the scrubber operator to then basically clean up the, the data to make sure that it's as pristine as possible. You know, if we don't pick up a throw, for example, we can add in the time the ball was thrown and the time it was caught. So we can add those different elements to know where it was thrown from and where it was thrown to. It's how we kind of worked with the, the previous system. But basically, the scrubber tool is, is, is uh, key for, for making sure that the data is complete. Um, <clears throat> Then you know behind those guys are is a, a whole suite of other you know there's a data ops supervisor who's basically looking at data from this system, but also another set of systems too. So we have our official score, the the stringer application as we call it, that that's you know entering the data for you know what actually happened on that play as a, an official record, and then we have another low latent uh, data feed in what we call the boss, which basically provides you know think of like what we show on the scoreboard so that the score updates immediately as soon as the player crosses the plate. And those, those three components, the stack ass system, the stringer, and the boss system work in concert to make sure that we have all the metadata uh, applied to all of the tracking data. And it's all tied together and they, they all work in concert in order to, um, um, to output the complete document of what happened for, for every play, for every game. Um, and then behind that, we also have Hawkeye support on, on call basically to, you know, for any issues that we see on, on the system so that they can go in and dive into it. So <clears throat> the, all these systems, are, they tie all this data together. And then on the outbound side, we're, we're providing all this data to broadcasters. We're providing it to you know, commercial providers like, uh, you know, we're delivering data to ESPN and we're delivering data to groups like Sport Radar for gambling purposes and things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, our own internal apps and clubs, of course, as well. Go ahead, next one. So how, how do we get here to today? So the um, we started installing once we chose you know we did some tests with Hawkeye back in March of 2019 or up to 20 March 2019, and we had two installations. We did Salt River and in Chase Field there in Arizona as well. Um, and then once we chose Hawkeye, we decided to install in all 30 parks as rapidly as possible. The original goal was to install it by All Star Game. I think some of them slips just past All Star Game, but you know we did you know did a lot of work to get those installed get them set up, get them calibrated, and then start collecting data on those so that we could then, for the goal of, by August, having the data, all the data from all the, from every venue so that we could share that with all the clubs. And we did that in August of 2019. Um, you know, the, the data there was, you know, we're still iterating pretty rapidly at that point in time. And so uh, when we started providing the data, the, the data continued to improve over time after that. Um, in the the <clears throat> the off season, this, 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 um, this winter, we were, removed all the legacy hardware. Um, and then between you know, the last month or so and up into, you know, through until even today, we're still, we're going through and calibrating all of the 2020 systems, getting them ready. You know, obviously with opening day being moved back, you know, that gives us a little bit more time to work on this, but um, the calibrations and ground truth tests in every, every venue has started happening um, back in February. And <laughs> this maybe is a little out of date, but you know we're we're to launch in production. We are in production now, as I guess in March, with uh, in the spring training up to, up to uh, yesterday, I guess. But uh, you know this will be ready to go on opening day across all thirty venues. Go to the next slide. So, um, what does the data look like from a completeness perspective? So this is just a sample of data, which I believe is for the postseason, um, just showing kind of the numbers and kind of you know. Did we achieve some of the goals we were looking for? And this is now remember, this was a system that was running in parallel to the production system, which was the current eco tracking system at, at that point in time that had oper you know, two operators that were running the system, making sure everything was working correctly for broadcast and all the other use cases. And the Hawkeye system was running largely unmanned for the most part. We hadn't really completed the we we had some bits and pieces of our, our tracking uh, of our operations tool that we're putting in place, but it was not fully featured yet at that point in time. So the system was running mostly on un unmanned. And what we're seeing in the data is, you know, across just about every front, we were, in, you know, improving on on their areas. So, um, let's see. So pop-ups, for example, like we're picking up on nearly 100% of those now, whereas we were about 40%. Bunts and bunts and even like throws that are thrown, you know, very softly were were being picked up as well. Um, to the point where, you know, over the course of spring training to this date, you know, <laughs> one of the challenges that I have is to figure out. How do I remove it and around the horn throw after a strikeout when the end of play is already is at the end of the around the horn? So um, just so we don't show that in into data sets, but also from a broadcast perspective, when they're trying to create a graphic for how how fast was the throw from this by 
say, the shortstop, when the ball's thrown back to the shortstop after they throw it to first, um, which of those two throws do they actually need to pick up that, that they're seeing in the data? So we're, we're picking up just about everything now, which is, which is great to see as well. I go to the next one. Sorry, Clay, Clay, take it away. Yeah, so thanks, Greg. Um, one thing Greg mentioned on the previous slide is the importance of completeness and uh, accuracy. Completeness is important in StatCast because the, one of the best things about StatCast is the context it provides to all these measurements. So in the previous slide where it showed we were measuring now more, more throws across the field, now that we have you know, almost 90% of the throws from third base to first base, we'll know a we'll better context to support when we see outstanding plays. So when a third baseman makes a 90 mile an hour throw to first base, we'll understand if that's really good or, or normal or exceptional. And part of the, some of these slides I'll show you will explain some more about the context, but also illustrate some of the testing results that we had in the 2018, 2019 off season and then show some examples of some of the different ways we measure things now uh, than we have in the past. So things that we want to test whenever we have a major technology change like this are things that we care about and things that we think will be hard to measure. So those are the two categories. The first uh, result here is the ground truth testing of the strike zone accuracy. This is not something we think is hard, but we think it's very important. And you can see there's some examples here of ground truth tests from 2016 and 2017 that indicate uh, you know, not great accuracy. Then we'll have uh, some tests from 2018 and 2019, which have, I think, very, very good accuracy. And then you'll see the Hawkeye test here in the middle, which is our accuracy going forward. And this, this chart can be thought of as an archery chart. Uh, it's accurate if all of the cl error clusters are centered around zero, and it's precise if that cluster is small. So whenever we do a strike zone ground truth test, we want to come back with a small grouping. We want that cloud of error to be centered on zero. So this is this test uh, are just examples from some of the technologies that StatCast has used in the past. And it, it gives us confidence that we're going to have some very accurate uh, ball track. So other thing that we care about a lot is being able to track hits. And uh, to assess how well uh, Legacy System and Hawkeye track hits, we used a LiDAR multi-station and a survey crew to actually mark where the balls landed. Then we could see how well did these systems calibrate, how well did they track uh, you know, hit trajectories that we think are pretty difficult. So this test was done at Chase Field, and we uh, tried to recreate hit trajectories that are difficult to track, which are ones that are really high up, really straight up, or ones that are down the line and really fast. Those are typically uh, Doppler transverse, and they're hard for the radar to see uh, when they go down the lines. And then when they go up really high, they have a very low velocity component in the direction of the radar. That's just a natural outcome of the technology. But we wanted to recreate some trajectories that were hard and, uh, and see if Hawkeye can measure them. So, and we did that, and we, we found that Hawkeye can measure these trajectories any of these difficult ones within a foot anywhere on the field. And the nice benefit of having a vision system here is because once the ball leaves the field of view of the cameras, uh, it can also reacquire that trajectory when it re-enters the field of view. So uh, reacquisition of trajectories is a big thing for us to be able to uh, track and, and, uh, and understand these uh, very long home run trajectories. So hit tracking is really good. That's the takeaway from this slide. And uh, so I mentioned things that are important to us and things that are difficult. If you were to ask me a couple of years ago uh, if a vision system can do everything a radar system does, I would say probably not as well. There's two things that radar-based systems do really well, and it's uh, identify the pitch release point and measure the total spin on the ball. So before we made this major shift in technology, we wanted to make sure that a vision system or any technology that we would use can do spin rate and measure the 3D release position. So I'm gonna play this slide while I talk about it a little bit. There's a bunch going on here, so I'll start explaining it. But this is a, a pitch release in slow motion. And you can see this, this curve here
this red, red circles on the dashed line, that's the free flight trajectory of the pitch. And that's important because that's what a, traje a pitch trajectory looks like when it's not being acted upon by a pitcher. Uh, what Hawkeye's done here is backwards extrapolated the free flight trajectory of the pitch to make the, this illustration of pitch release a little bit better. So that's the free flight pitch release. It's backwards extrapolated. Now, I want to pause here and show these curves here, which are green and white, are part of the biometric uh, tracking functions of Hawkeye. So what we look at here is the elbow with the little red trace here, and the green one indicates a curve that is the ball in hand. And so basically what Hawkeye does is fit these data points and figure out where the ball in hand curve and the free flight trajectory uh, coincide or when those curves cross. And that uh, is a pretty interesting way to predict pitch release point. Uh, the thing I like about their method is not necessarily that it's novel, but that it works really well. And in the first tests we've done, we did to, on pitch release, we, I didn't understand how they were doing this with a frame with 100 frame per second camera. And uh, then they you know, explained this to me. So it's a confluence of biomechanical tracking and ball tracking that allows us to not only get the 3D pitch release point, it also delivers the complete pitch release signature of this pitcher. So this will help us and analysts understand not only if a release point is repeatable, but if this entire release signature is repeatable amongst one pitch or amongst different pitches. So this pitch release, uh, very important to us, and we definitely tested it before we decided to do Haw Hawkeye as a as a tracking vendor, and uh, the way they've done it is pretty novel. So uh, this is a pretty interesting outcome for me. Yeah, and one thing to add to that is, you know, this is what we were saying before, where we wanted to make sure we're leveraging what is the you know latest technology. You know, when you move from one tracking system that has one methodology to another one that has a different methodology, you need to make sure that the results stay consistent. You know, the clubs are expecting spin rate and release point to be within specific ranges. Now, there's a debate of whether or not those are true or not, but like that's the realm of what the, is the expectation is. You know, if they are different, we need to understand why they're different, and so we can explain them. So, in the case of what you're seeing here, you know, we're you know Hawkeye's doing a really interesting job in providing a lot of other data points that we can use to extract data, so that you know if we realize that you know we can fit the data that we're getting from release point to what Hawkeye was providing. I'm sorry, what TrackMan was providing uh, historically. But from TrackMan's perspective, they were just seeing when was the ball starting to slow down and that's the point when the release point was. Versus what Hawkeye is doing is they're actually doing some very intricate work here where we can manipulate other bits and pieces of the mechanics to extract other bits of information. So for example, when is the first time the batter actually sees the ball? It's something we could probably figure out before, you know, that's different than the release point. So uh, it, this is kind of just highlights what, you know, why we chose Hawkeye and specifically why we're really excited about the system because of what we can do based on having all these data points tracked. Go ahead, Clay. And that's, that's, a, that's an important piece there and that this is also illustrated by spin rate. So spin rate is something that's super important to clubs and it's also something that is measured really well by radar and can be measured uh, optically too, but it's definitely something we wanted to test beforehand. And the way, the way a Hawkeye measures spin is it uh, assesses the ball orientation in successive frames during the pitch release. So here we have a pitch release event, and then we've got about 20 frames where we ascertain the ball's orientation. And they figure out where the laces are on the ball by using a, Harris, a variant of the Harris edge detecting algorithm, which is a machine, uh, machine vision algorithm. But understanding the orientation frame to frame, they can use uh, a best fit to figure out what the spin rate is. One of the byproducts to support what Greg was saying, uh, differences in methodology, one of the byproducts is that since they use 20 frames, about 0.2 seconds, about half of the pitch trajectory for delivery, they're going to bake in some of the spin decay that's natural for a pitch. So that's one, uh, it's very small compared to the actual spin of the pitch, but that's one interesting side product of measuring the spin this way. All right, the, uh, since we're 
ascertaining the position of the seams in all these frames in order to get spin, we also get something that's, also, that's pretty interesting and it's turning an ingredient into a product and that is understanding the orientation of the seams on a pitch. It's not something we've done typically with radar-based tracking, but it's now we have the foundation to do that with vision-based tracking. Uh, the reason that's important is for pitch design. You know, I've got two graphics down here showing a, uh, a four seam and a two seam fastball. You're both spinning at the same rate. In the, in the Bayer Magnus model, both of these pitches that have the same initial conditions uh, will probably move differently because of the seam orientation. But uh, previously, we had not been able to account for that in the movement. In fact, we would actually um, try to understand the spin rate components of a pitch based on its movement. That's when we would use a Magnus model. Now we're directly measuring spin rate, we're directly measuring spin axis, and as a byproduct, we're also going to be able to ascertain seam orientation. So this way we can understand how asymmetric aerodynamic uh, effects uh, impact a ball's trajectory. So that's a great byproduct. And if you guys follow Martin Smith and seam, seam shifted wake on baseballaero.com, uh, I think this will make, uh, make him happy eventually. All right. All right, so for player tracking, and I'll show us track, uh, the next slide, I'll show what we've done in the past, but in the past, we've only been able to uh, get one, basically one coordinate of a player's position in, within the course of a play. But now we're gonna be able to get 19 points on the skeleton of each player, each umpire, each base runner uh, during a play. And that's pretty valuable, not just because it helps us understand the biomechanics of all the actors involved in this play, but it'll also tell us not where a person is at some event time, but also what they're looking at. It'll also show us what the torque is on their joints. What's, what's their first step? How big is their stride and what direction is it? So there's a lot of uh, interesting questions that can be answered by this markless motion tracking technology. And we'll be able to have the context of every play in every season for every player uh, to understand how well performance changes. All right, so our legacy system would give us uh, basically kind of these shadow or uh, pixel clusters. And from that, we would get a center of mass. And it, there's some, a lot of value in figuring out where all the players are for play and how they interact with the events. And now we have 19 points on a skeleton. So we can see all these, all these joints, all these torques, all these, uh, all these limb, limb tracking, uh, which is gonna, create some interesting opportunities. And in yeah, addition, should, oh yeah, go ahead, Greg. So yeah, so sorry to interrupt you, Clay, but, but one of the really interesting things that we can, you know, able to extract now, things we can build on our side from, uh, from detecting of these elements. Once we have this 19 point limb system, we can start automatically detecting things like scoops at first base or the types of throw between, you know, but, you know, at an exchange around second base for a double play, for example, is it underhand, is it overhand, is it sidearm, you know, all these different elements, you know, having all these limb tracking elements, you know, we'll see the glove, how far was the reach actually, it'll also help us understand, you know, with tracking systems, the, the ball is lost at some point in time, but is that actually when it's caught? It may or may not be, and this will allow us to understand how close are we to where you know, the first baseman is reaching out, how close is that ball trajectory? Where is that actually located? So we can actually define all these other elements that, you know, we haven't really focused on yet, but having these limb tracking data will allow us to do that exactly. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I haven't even thought about, first, how much does the first baseman help uh, the surrounding fielders? Interesting. All right. All right, so uh, another element that's going to be available by, by virtue of this technology is bat tracking. This is probably not something that we're going to deliver to clubs on opening days, but the foundation's in place for this. So with bat tracking, uh, some interesting questions can be answered about an at-bat or a bat-ball collision, not just the swing signature of the player, but where on the bat the ball made contact. And where's the swing plane with respect to the pitch plane? 
So these are things that can now be measured pretty reliably. And because, as Greg was saying earlier, completeness is our goal, we can develop context all over the league about what hitters' exit velocity profiles look like for pulled pitches versus uh, going the other way. The other thing that's, that I think is even more interesting is understanding bat tracking as it pertains to assessing how well pitches uh, perform. So which pitcher or which pitch is the best at missing bats? Which is the best pitch at disrupting timing? Now we always can understand what a swing and miss pitch is. We can understand when they're early or late, but now we can understand are they early or late by how many milliseconds? And that probably doesn't give us any, uh, any benefit with no context. But since we can measure all this across the league for every game, every at bat, it allows us to build up that context so we know what the 10 milliseconds late is in the big scheme of things. So this, this opens up a lot of opportunity for a lot analysis and it'll help us you know, understand what's going on in the game and be able to tell a better story about it. Um, Greg, I'll let you take data delivery here. Sure. So, you know. You know, we're, tr we're transitioning partners. We're going to a new partner, and one of the, the other key elements that, that we wanted to make sure we we delivered here was that uh, the data was delivered um, outbound uh, in the same format as we were historically. So, you know, that was a key element. We, we you know we have thirty clubs. We have lots of other vendors that are used to the format that we're providing providing it. So, we needed to make sure that we maintain that consistency, which we've done uh, delivering through our stats API to clubs and partners and everyone else. You know, it should be this. It's, it's the same data format, so there should be no change to that whatsoever. You know, public data metrics that we, we've provided publicly um, are going to be consistent as well. So everything that, that you would have access to now um, are going to be the same. Um, unfortunately, not, we're not sharing any more data at this point than, than we have historically. But you know, as, as time goes on, I, I would imagine that we would, we would continue to deliver some. Um, we'll be delivering the skeletal data and bat tracking data to clubs in, in Q2. Um, we we're hoping for opening day, but uh, that's a bit of a stretch goal. Um, uh, frankly, I've not even looked at that data yet. We're still really dialing in on all of the, the pitch components and, and all the other tracking elements to maintain that consistency. Um, but uh, once we, we have that, we, we plan to be delivering that to clubs and, to, um, um, and using that in our products as well. Um, and then, you know, as I said before, we'll have some expanded integrations on, on all of our, the properties that, that we deliver publicly, whether it be MLB.com, Game Day, the MLB app, or uh, Baseball Savant as well. Go to the next one. Um, so, you know, to kind of highlight some of the things that we, we're looking at the future, just as Clay was mentioning, you know, swing mechanical analysis. So, you know, you know the timing, you know, is, did, they, did they miss the pitch because of timing or because of the swing plane missing the pitch plane? You know, there's other things like, you know, which batter is the most consistent with their timing of delivering, uh, of hitting, making contact, for example, who's the best of fouling balls based on timing specifically, it's things of like that. It's really interesting things in that area that we can, we can do some analysis on. Um, you know, for pitcher mechanics and injury prevention, something we certainly are very interested, in, both for the, you know, the league as a whole and the clubs are certainly individually. Um, but a lot of this, the true biomechanic data, you know, to, for this type of area, to so make sure that their true form is consistent and precise to what they would expect or what they would like to do in, say, a laboratory condition. Um, that requires higher frame rate data, uh, higher frame rate cameras. That's we'll need to get from that point. You know, 300 to 500 frames per second is what I hear is what you really truly need to make sure you have the right fidelity to get uh, true what, what would be called biomechanic data. Um, you know, pitcher, runner, fielder reaction times. With all the limb tracking data, you can see the actual first movement of everything. Pitcher first movement and some other other elements will be able to just see all these things at much more uh, fine grain, but it, you know expanded across the field. Um, this is you know we're going to be expanding as a supplemental resource for instant replay. Uh, one example of that is you know creating a system that can automatically detect a play that is of a condition that is a close play or something that would be reviewed. So a close play at first or you know, some other, you know, a close play at home, things like that, where, you know, we can identify it in the tracking data, we can automatically inform, uh, the, you know, the office in New York to say, hey, there's a play here that you might want to review. So they can start queuing that up for, for the umpires there to start taking a look at it if they're not, you know, already working on another play at that point in time. So they can, you know, decrease the time that re uh, instant replay takes in order to make that call happen. Uh, and then there's a lot of other use cases that we're thinking of, but we just haven't quite gotten to that. 
Go back to the last one. Mm -hmm. so, can you go back to the last slide, Clay? Well, I guess we can show this too. <laughs> So go back to the last slide. Let me just try to finish up those last couple of points. Sorry, folks. Um, so fielder route analysis, reenactments. Um, again, like I was saying before, um, all the different elements that you would have, you know, we have the center of mass before, which we could do a lot from the center of mass, but from, a, from say, just the center fielder's perspective, did they lean one direction and that's why they're, or did they actually run that direction? You know, what are the reactions and how does that look? You know, that's just like simple examples of just really precise ways we can, the next level of how we can extract information from, from these player tracks. Uh, and then, you know, one of the things that we're working on as well is baking in um, uh, into, into game day, a 3D simulation of what happened, which uh, Clay just tipped our hand and showed some of what it was, but, uh, we have a demo that kind of showed us like the possibilities of what this limb tracking data can do. Um, so go ahead and go to that other, other slide or go to the, the demo itself. Um, so this is data from the, from the all-star game last year. And when we first saw this, we're like, okay, we can really do something with this. And hopefully the fidelity may not come through, but it's a very smooth animation, but you can really see the, you can almost see the care who the players are by just how the, their movements are. The, the, the data is so is, is so granular. Um, so we'll be um, we may zoom in a little bit more on that. Well, anyways, the, you know this is detecting you know all the players in the field. And this again, this is all star game of last year, and just the the level of fidelity kind of blew us away and realized that we had a product here that we we really need to get. So we want to bake this into game day. Um, hopefully before the end of this season. Um, you know, like I said, we, we still haven't really worked on uh, what this data looks like yet. Once we, you know, once the dust settles um, after opening day, whatever that may be at the moment, um, the uh, we'll, we'll be dial, dialing into this limb tracking data to see what this looks like. You know, do some analysis of it. You know, build in some tooling to make sure we can deliver all this data to uh, you know consumers and then um, show it in our game day products. So there you go. So that's the 2020 stack S system. You know, it's going to be in all 30 parks. Um, so thank you. Um, I guess I, or we can do a round of questions now, I, I guess. Here, I'll, Greg, why don't I go through mine and then we'll do questions after that or? Sure thing. Yeah, go for it. Aaron. <laughs> uh, one sec. I have a video to show too, uh, showing the limb tracking that, with that uh, Eddie Ellie has been working on. It's kind of a supplement to what you just showed. It's really cool. So I'm sharing my screen right here. Is this playing? Yeah, it looks good there. Cool. So yeah, it just shows the capabilities of this. Um, this is also from the All-Star Game. Okay, uh, I'm just going to go through a, a, a quick uh, StatCast metrics update with uh, Jason Bernard. We're going to... Um, Talk about a few, of the, uh, a few of the things that we added last year, um, some core building blocks of things that we've added to start really putting some pieces together to come up with maybe like a stack cast war in the future. Um, so um, here's a, this is a brief look back in 2019. So what we added, um, we started off by adding catcher framing, basically taking uh, what we call attack zones. Um, we look at balls and strikes, call them uh, in those attack zones called the shadow the shadow zone, basically anything that could be in between a ball or a strike. And we came up with a metric uh, based off that. Tom Tango has done a lot of work with all these metrics, but um, uh, that was one of the uh, key pieces we added last year. Um, another one we added last year was outfielder jump. It's basically a, a component to outs above average. It, it goes hand in hand but it tells you, it breaks down any individual play based off uh, their reaction, their burst, and their route. What we defined as reaction was the first zero to 1.5 seconds of a play, and then the burst, which is when they really have to start running, so uh, the uh, first uh, one and a half seconds to three seconds, and then we generalize the whole thing as route, 
which is zero to three seconds. Um, recently, we also rolled out uh, a lot of people in wait for as our infield outs above average. Uh, Jason Bernard will go more into that uh, in a few moments. Uh, we also added pitch movements. We uh, have been, me, Mike Petrello, Tom, we've been going back and forth for a long time about how we wanted to approach uh, pitch movement. And what we decided at the end of the day was we were going to add, uh, report it with gravity, which uh, makes our numbers a little bit larger than the ones that other uh, people put out. Uh, but um, we're really happy with the way it turned out. Um, another thing that we released last year was active spin. Um, basically, uh, the spin that contributes to the movements. We introduced a rolling leaderboard, which is basically windows into various uh, breakdowns of plate appearances to show basically who's hot and who's not. That went out last year. Um, you can break it down through X uh, exit velocity, uh, expected bag and average, um, a bunch of uh, various different metrics. Um, we also introduced a custom leaderboard. So basically you can go um, to one of the leaderboards on Savant and you can uh, create a leaderboard of anything you want. So all these stat cast metrics, sprint speed, pop time, uh, outs above average, you can go to this page, you can create your own leaderboard, you can share it um, on Twitter or wherever. And uh, it just kind of allows the user to create whatever they want. Um, another thing we, we started testing last year with Savant was basically um, ways to start supplementing StatCast data into traditional, we'll say like box scores and scoreboards. So, you know, uh, not trying to take away from traditional box scores, but um, there are things we could probably add that might help out to the user experience. So what we experimented with last year was adding pitch types, like a, like a simple pie chart that shows what pitches a pitcher used in a game. Um, we, we, toyed around with adding the hard hit with like an emoji or something like that. Um, so you could tell how at a quick glance, which pitchers are being hit in this game. Um, we supplemented uh, the scoreboard with uh, adding pitch, uh, average pitch velocities um, along with, uh, you can see, pull up the scoreboard and it'll show you exactly what pitches Trevor Story's seen in a particular at bat. Um, we added uh, win probability last season, so you can pull up any game and it'll tell you the win probability of either team. Uh, it'll tell you who the leaders are uh, for various stat cast metrics, such as uh, exit velocity, um, the WPA leaders, and it'll show you uh, the fastest pitches of the game. So uh, we're just trying to supplement the user experience. We're, we're testing all this out in Savant for hopes of maybe one day adding it to mobile.com. Uh, Oh, we opened up the whole catalog of videos last year. Um, so any video back to 2018, um, every pitch is available publicly. Um, there's a lot of really cool things you can do with it. So like if you look at right here, you, if you pull up a video on Savant, you can decide which broadcast you want. So if you want to see the home broadcast or if something's like obfuscated in the play because the cameras were off, you can switch to the away broadcast and try to get a different view. Um, we're testing around like supplementing data with video. So um, with the new system, we should be able to have a, be able to start using computer vision to put this zone chart, say on the actual broadcast video, um, but also supplement data to help uh, strengthen the experience, the broadcast experience. Um, and I don't know if the, this was last week, we uh, added a new video page on MLB.com. It's amazing. You can quickly filter whatever uh, video you want. Uh, so you want to see all my trials home runs. Uh, you can just, it's a few clicks away. Um, so if you haven't seen that, check it out. It's amazing. Um, Darren, you mind if I make a few comments there? So yeah, so my team's been working on this for a long time. The the video search we just launched uh, was it Wednesday of last week, maybe it's Thursday. And uh, if you haven't seen it yet, please go take a look at it. just the video section on MLB and just find the search part component of it. But basically, every bit of metadata, any split that we have in our data, uh, at least it, 
at a pretty robust level. I think there's more that we can still provide to it and we're going to continue to do so. But every day, every video from going back to 2018, and we're looking at um, even before that as well um, at this point, um, we're, we're going to probably add a few more years as well. But it's every other bit of editorial data we have too and all the meta tags that are there as well. So if you want to go see all the way back to the, the 30s, we can see all the videos that we have in our system that was always on our site. We just didn't have a good way for, for fans to go and access it. But now you can go and access that. And we want to really make sure that um, everybody can see this and we'll continue to improve that over time. And now that we have this, this platform to, to build upon, uh, I think you're going to see a lot of really interesting things here. So for example, you know, Darren has a, in the middle there, he has a the strike zone. You know, eventually we'll be able to draw the strike zone. If you want to see pitches by this pitcher in this location that are this type so that you can see that directly. That's something that certainly can come you know, now that we have the system in place. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And uh, shout out to Joe Davey for putting that all together, or most of it together, the back end at least. Uh, it's lightning fast. It's amazing. It's, the technology behind it is incredible. Um, coming soon uh, to Savant is the what we call the home run leaderboards. So basically, we're taking um, all the home runs or hit last year, and we're kind of breaking them down. So what we're calling doubters, home runs that would have been hit at seven or fewer stadiums, um, mostly gone home run at eight to 29 stadiums. And then no doubters are home runs that are gone at all 30 stadiums. Uh, along with that, we're gonna add a leaderboard for home run, average home run trot. Um, so this is like the, last year's current top 10 you're looking at right here. This will be available relatively shortly. Um, you'll be able to click on any player, pull the video. It'll tell you how many parts it would have gone out at, um, the home run trot. Uh, it should be pretty cool. I, I think everybody's always interested in like, when they see a home run, uh, barely just got out. We'll be able to tell you how many parts it actually would have gone out of. And um, I think it's gonna be a really cool new feature. Oops. Okay, Jason, take it away. Thanks, Aaron. Right there. Uh, so earlier this year, we were able to release our highly anticipated infield outs above average metric. Uh, and as a testament to the entire community, uh, we've made strides in the terms of defensive research. So we started from non-contextual base defense with put outs and assists, uh, moved towards zone ratings with bad ball uh, locations. Uh, the first iteration of UZR and DRS, which focused mostly on putting an average field location to where we are today with Stackass, uh, putting in uh, per play fielding location. Uh, so with infield outs of average, we're able to assign responsible fielders uh, by their position and their role. And we're, allowed, we're able to assess the difficulty of the play on a per play basis based on the fielder's starting position rather than average. Um, Dan, you can go to the next slide. Oops. So an example, an example that we use, and you can find this in uh, a tech blog post that we have uh, on in, infield outs above average. Uh, this is a Brian Anderson play from last year that is a 50-50 play. I'll kind of explain why it's 50-50 play in a bit. Uh, but for infield outs above average, we're looking at three main components. Uh, the likelihood of the fielder gets to the ball, uh, in this case it's 100% for Eduardo Escobar, uh, the likelihood he is to feel that ball and not make an error. So in this case, it's 97.5%. And the chance that he gets the ball to first in this case before the runner gets there. Uh, in this case, there's a 55.1% chance of that happening. Um, the screenshot on the left is what we call the intercept point, which is the moment that the ball and the fielder uh, intersect. Uh, this is a snapshot at the moment. So Escobar is 107 feet from first base at that moment. And Anderson is 47 feet away from first at that moment. Uh, so the reason it's a 50-50 play is because based on where they are at this moment, they have between 1.7 and 1.8 seconds to get to first. Uh, Escobar 1.7 to 1.8 to throw the ball and 1.7 1.8 for Anderson to get to the base. Um, when you mix all of the three components together, uh, you get the estimated success rate or the out probability for the play. In this case, it's 53.7%. Uh, the play in turn ends up being originally called safe, 
Oh, uh, sorry. It was originally called out, but then it was reversed by replay after the fact. <laughs> so, in effect, this is the perfect 50 50 play uh, that we could have produced. Uh, next slide, Dan. So, in the same vein that we do for outfield outs of average, infield outs of average uh, gives you gives credit for the plays that the fielder makes and dings them for the ones that they didn't make uh, as the responsible fielder. So in the case of in aggregates, uh, the success rates result in the, in the number of plays an average fielder makes, uh, which results in the chart shown there. So to explain the chart, uh, if you look at the 20 to 79% estimated success rate group, uh, what this chart is telling you is that of plays in that group, uh, the estimated success rate uh, was 61%, and in actuality, uh, the play is converted into an out 64% of the time. So th that chart uh, shows you both the estimated success rate of those plays, as well as the actual success rate um, on those example plays. Um, yeah, okay, next slide there. Uh, so the way it's broken down is that uh, it's on a per play basis. Um, we're obviously using our own stackcast data, uh, both range and throwing components are used together on the play and the role starting position are used separately uh, which you can see clearly on the next slide uh, on baseball savant where darren has been able to uh, take the data and create some cool visuals uh, such as allowing you to see directional components as well as a breakdown of each role uh, that the, that the player had and their outs above average in the corresponding roles. Uh, yeah. And as breaking news for a highly anticipated two years of waiting uh, announced here at Sabre 2018, uh, we are releasing Stackass ERA today. It is live, it's currently live in the expected stats leaderboard uh, for the pitcher only. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there are some very good names at the top. Emilio Pagan and Tara Glasnow had great seasons last year and deservedly so lead the leaderboard in XERA. Um, so the way we calculate that is we, we're translating XWOBA to the ERA scale. Um, it allows you to see the pit, how the pitcher's ERA compares to the expected, val the expected value based on the bad ball profile. Uh, if you go on Baseball Savant, there, you won't see a league average because the league average is... Uh, whatever the ERA average is for Major League Baseball. Darren, back to you. Yeah, okay. Uh, so one last thing we wanted to touch on was the MLB Tech Technology blog. Um, when we re released that, uh, Benjamin Lovick has been working really hard on it. Um, but it basically warehouses all our cool technology that we've done. Uh, Clay's written a couple articles. We did recently did one on how we classify our pitches, the technology behind it, how it started. Um, so it's got like, it's still pretty early on, but there's some amazing articles already on there. So if you're ever interested, uh, you should take a look at uh, the technology blog. And that's it. We'll take questions on the microphone here. Can you guys hear this? Not super well. Okay, speak loud. Um, is the strike zone model uh, now 3D or is it still kind of like 2D? So when you say it goes through like a certain section of the, the zone, is it just kind of like taken from like the center of the plate or is it kind of, it's been in this zone for more than any of the other zones during its like 3D trajectory? Is it, is it possible for somebody to relay that question? It's kind of pretty muddled. Yeah, the question was, um, is the strike zone like model 3D now, or is it we still seeing like a, just a 2D plane when we kind of see that it goes through when you say where the pitch landed? 
Well, the the data is in 3D and the plate is 3D. We're just rendering it on so on broadcast or on on uh, game day. We just rendered it in 2D. We actually use it in 3D for many many uses, including umpire evaluation, other other ways as well. Um, ABS system is built off of was built off a of 3D system, 3D strike zone as well. So um, all the data is captured in 3D. It's just a matter of how we're we're rendering it. ABS is on ball strike. I don't know. Yeah, right. Sorry. <laughs> I figured this crowd might know what ABS is, <laughs> but just maybe make, even though, yeah. Just make sure. I I just wonder how accessible this data is, who it's accessible to, whether there's any conditions under which it's accessible and not accessible so we're not we're not announcing any changes into the accessibility of the data you know, we, you know as a policy the the full 3d data we don't we don't publish publicly but you know the other data that's on savant and uh, through other means that are out there whether it be through our stats api and other ways um those are, are will be, continue to be available just as they are now thanks I love the uh, new feature on Savant with the video and being able to click on a pitch and see the, the highlight and whatnot. I was just curious uh, with MLB with the video if we'll be able to choose different camera angles for that as it's always center field view. And I was just curious if how can we access the different camera angles that might be available. Thanks. Yeah, well, I, I can answer that first, but there is, there's two, there's up to three different camera angles on there right now, basically home, away, or a network if it's a network game, but there are, we do have other angles, and I'll let I'll let Greg talk to that. Yeah, um, it's a great question, and it's something that clubs ask us all the time. We're we're providing other angles to the clubs already. Um, that's something we can take back to fit. You know, if there's a an appetite for that publicly, we could we could consider um, exposing that. But um, you know, our goal is to capture all these cameras, get them into our system, so we can use them for for many purposes. Um, but you know, obviously, it's a it's a fairly large technical challenge to get some of the the new camera angles. So, for example, we have a high home view that that we provide the clubs. We have another center field camera view that we have. And there's some other bits and pieces that are out there as well. I mean, the the video that you see usually is the the broadcast, either the home or away broadcast, or a national one, as as Darren said. And we usually stick to that from a for a public perspective. Um, but if there's an appetite for that, I mean, some, certainly something we could consider um, that I can take back uh, to to consider as a part of our product offering. Yeah, that'd be great. And then maybe, you know, the process to become a partner where you might be able to access some of that, where it's not public, but yet you're a partner. So that'd be also something to explore. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, on the data feed, the release with the release point hasn't been provided. Uh, it's been uh, the 50-foot point. The starting speed used to be starting speed at 50 feet, and then it changed to release point starting speed. I'm wondering what those two components will be for the 2020 data. Um, that will still be the same. Um, you know, we did that for your kind of legacy pr perspective. It will still be the release point speed um, as it was when we switched to the, the full stack S system in 2017. Um, the, the, the 50 feet is legacy to, you know, back to 2007 when we first started doing pitch tracking. Let me take that one back as well to kind of see if that's something that we could consider going back to the, to the true release point as well. I haven't even considered that because you know what we expose publicly. We're actually you know we have the full polynomial as it's you know from the full release point, but we did that kind of just for consistency when we transitioned back in 2017 to the new data set. We did just get that, and we're just manipulating that that polynomial to start at that 50 foot stick. Thank you. But yeah, I'll take that back. 